welcome to the CEO Roundtable on Financial Network's Need for Speed, the Challenges and Opportunities. My name is Jamie Scott Okataya. We, uh, it's uh, JSA, Jamie Scott and Associates is our company. We are the PR, marketing, and event planning firm for telecom. So welcome to Telecom Exchange and welcome to our CEO Roundtable. We are honored to present a panel of the industry's leading innovators. Each speaker here today has been carefully selected as they represent an important piece of the telecom ecosystem. And they are each breaking ground with their news, their products, their services, the networks that they're building. I'm looking at you. <laughs> so for example, we have Mr. Bjarni Dervadison, CEO of Hibernia Atlantic. And his team is building Project Express. You may have heard of it. It's the fastest connection, it will be, between New York City and London, sub 60 milliseconds. We're talking real fast. Um, and with Hibernia's constant network enhancements, both subsea and terrestrial, their global network now spans Europe, North America, and Asia. So uh, notably, many key financial cities. So welcome, Bjarni. And then we have Mr. Eric Kontag. He's a COO of GlobeNet. GlobeNet is the subsea cable network that connects North and South America. And with Bovespa as one of the largest exchanges in terms of market value, GlobeNet's lowest latency route between New York and Sao Paulo is famous and it's critical for the financials. GlobeNet with its parent company, OI, also has an extensive terrestrial reach throughout South America. So welcome, Eric. Thanks, Jamie. And also with us here today, we have Sheldon Walkwin. He's the CTO of Octelian. His company designs and builds optical networking gear, allowing for high capacity, next gen, carrier grade WDN networks. And just recently, their product line, known as the Light Gain System, received its MEF certification, certification for its Ethernet private line applications. So Sheldon can talk about latest product technologies attractive for supporting those financial networks. Mr. Satoshi Adachi joins us from Telehouse America. <coughs> Obviously, Telehouse is a global brand in data center operations and has strong local roots right here in the New York City area with uh, its Staten Island facility, of course, 25 Broadway, and its new Chelsea Center site. The Telehouse brand also extends globally with facilities in Asia including a new expansion in Beijing, as well as Europe and South Africa. So interesting layer one perspective and reach. Thank you. And rounding out our fabulous panel, we have Mr. Jay Lawrence. He's the CEO of Nextcom Wireless. Partnering with service providers, his company <coughs> delivers broadband for high performance networks. But not the wireless of yesterday. That's packet based, not that stuff. We're talking layer one radio that can be as fast as light. So welcome, Jay. Thanks and good pitch. Thanks. <laughs> and now to further introduce these key innovators, we are very honored to have our leading lady, Dr. Judy Reed Smith. She is the founder uh, and the CEO of Atlantic ACM. Judy. Thank you very much, Jamie, and these panelists, and this wonderful, nice, full audience. Uh, I want to have this run as a conversation, and if you want to be part of the conversation, stick your hand up and wave, and we will ask your question as we go along. We would be delighted to have you um, tap these fine minds to answer any questions you have. I'm going to start out by asking each of them to tell us, Jamie beautifully covered their companies and what they're doing. I want them each to tell you exactly how they are serving their clients in the financial industry in order to provide the lowest latency possible. So we'll start with Bjarni. Um, thank you, Judy. I saw Hunter there sitting at the edge of his seat waiting, yeah, waiting to pitch it. his question. <laughs> as soon as you said we'll it. answer questions from anybody but Hunter. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Hyperion Atlantic is servicing three uh, customer groups, the, the wholesale uh, media customers and the financial customers. So what, what we are addressing here is the primarily the, the financial customers. And what we, what we are doing there, we have been um, focusing on, and we probably were one of the earlier ones, or, or if not the first in, in certain 
uh, regions to uh, pioneer and offer the, the lowest latency, absolute lowest latency to the high frequency traders and those that, uh, that really uh, needed and, and wanted and could justify paying for the low latency circuits. As we know, there are, there are, there are a number of customer groups, groups that, that desire to have the lowest latency, but it, it's m mostly the financial customers that, are, that can justify the investment and the build, the new build to, um, to get that incremental latency savings, be that a microsecond or a millisecond. So it is, from that perspective, it's, sir, it's finding or building the lowest latency fiber solution between those, um, those financial exchanges. And, and as we know, those, those that are here, the, the most busy financial exchanges are, by far, uh, New York, it is London, it is Frankfurt, and Chicago. <clears throat> those are the ones that we started focusing on. And then we added on Toronto, then we added on Tokyo, um, and, um, and others that are, go down to Singapore. And, and we have a, a probably a, a selection of, of uh, about 12 cities that we, that we uh, call the, the GFN, or now the, the, uh, the Global Express Network. Um, so that, that's about uh, what, we are, what we are offering, and of course, Today, the Atlantic is about 65 milliseconds, 64.8 milliseconds in terms of uh, the fastest circuit. And when we have the Project Express ready to go a latter half of next year, that will be sub 60 milliseconds, as Jamie said, 59.8, uh, give or take. So that's what we strive towards when we are servicing the financial customers. It is to, to be able to provide the absolute fastest, the lowest latency circuit between those uh, trading exchanges. Excellent, thank you very much, and Eric. And thank you, Judy, and thanks, Jamie, for inviting me to, to participate. Um, Globenet owns and operates the lowest latency subsea cable system connecting the United States with South America. We land in, in Bermuda, Brazil, Colombia, and, and Venezuela. And uh, we watch Bjarni very carefully. I mean, they've done a great job. <laughs> thank you. And uh, if, if you've looked at the financial markets over the last several years, you see that Brazil is emerging as, as a key um, growth country in Latin America. The, the stock exchange in Bovespa has been very, very active. And we happen to own the lowest latency network asset. Um, and what we've done is work very, very closely with our parent company, OI, in Brazil, as well as with partners in the United States to really try to squeeze out every single microsecond that we, ha that we can to even improve the latency that we've offered. Um, we're in the 108 and a half millisecond um, range. There's nobody else that can that can even come close, let's say to that um, to that number. And due to the innovation of of using the right combination of technology and and service, Globenet was recently recognized um, by two leading industry um, publications, one in the United States and one in Europe, um, for for the services that we provide into the financial community. Um, I think that. Brazil in general is, is the strongest economy and by far the largest economy in Latin America. Um, it's generating a billionaire a year over the last five years in the stock market and definitely having connectivity uh, between, let's say, the New York exchanges and Bovespa and between Bovespa and, let's say, Chicago or even London across Hibernia is something that is very attractive to, to the financial community. Please, Sheldon. All right, thank you. Completely uh, different version. Yeah, a different version? Okay, I'll give it from a... a, a no, I uh, first, mean, I'd like to say thank you for uh, <laughs> inviting me to this. I appreciate yeah. that. And Jamie as well, thank you. Uh, so, uh, for me, I'm, I'm with an optical networking equipment company, so we're in the business of actually uh, designing and manufacturing the equipment that goes into these networks. Um, you know, so how are we serving those low latency connections? It's by providing equipment that can provide very low latency whether it's at the physical layer through very low latency, uh, dispersion compensation, regeneration, switching elements, or even TDM, uh, just sort of layer one technologies. Um, one of the big things in, 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 in helping address it is really in doing the system design though, because it's not really just the components, it's how you design everything that goes into supplying that connection that gives you that latency. So that's where we play. Excellent, thank you very much. Go ahead, Sadara. All right, thank you. Thank you for so much, Judy, as well as uh, Jamie. And Petahouse is a kind of a global uh, a collocation brand of uh, our parent company of KDDI, which is the uh, uh, second largest of uh, Japanese telecom insurance company. And uh, we've been uh, serving uh, uh, services um, for more than 20 years here in New York, 
United States, especially in the tri tri-state area. And uh, what we are doing uh, is actually to, uh, to help uh, carriers and financial sectors uh, to run their business very stably. And uh, in order to uh, do so, we are feeding power and cooling very stably. And, uh, and, and due to, so, uh, to do so, uh, we, are, we have a strategic policy to run uh, our collocation uh, size. And uh, um, then we can grow up uh, by, you know, uh, or, 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 uh, everybody is coming up into those facility, especially for financial and uh, telecom carriers mutually grow. Thank you so much. Thank you, Satoshi. And Jay? And uh, Judy and uh, Jamie, thank you as well. Pleasure to be here. Uh, we are the uh, crazy wireless guys that you hear a lot about. Um, <clears throat> Nextcom is a, uh, uh, really a next generation wireless company, but uh, we present ourselves as a high performance broadband solutions business. Uh, like Hibernia, we have multiple sides to our business. Uh, one of it is the trading application. Uh, one of the things that is unique about us is that we are a OSI layer one shop, so I hear other layer one friends around the table, that's great to see. Uh, but layer one gives us an advantage in the wireless space, which is somewhat counterintuitive, and it also leads to one of our favorite catchphrases, which we don't molest our bits. <laughs> um, so the velocity of speed of light, plus a very efficient radio system and architecture and the plans that we have, and we've got some really fun technology, uh, we're able to get some lickety split uh, bits between uh, any trading centers we're building here in the States, building in New York, uh, London and Frankfurt, um, <clears throat> and uh, we'll be within nanoseconds of speed of light in, in some of those quarters. Excellent, thank you. So we have these financial service companies and there are at least 20 to 30 of them by our count who are doing this high speed trading and they've really only been doing it, you know, like five or seven years uh, that they have needed this service and have been building it. And there will be some opportunities ahead. So what exactly are the challenges that you feel you're facing uh, and uh, what opportunities come out of solving those challenges? Should we start with Jay this time? Yeah, I think for us, uh, part of it's being the new kid on the block. Um, you know, wireless is new to this application, but it's certainly not new uh, to the world. And uh, <clears throat> beyond that, there's an issue of planning, uh, spectrum management, what have you. But what we have found is that more and more uh, the finance client uh, sees microwave as a necessary part of their business. So what we're trying to do is, as I said, take the wireless out of wireless. Uh, our handoff is a wire. Our networks are strings of Christmas tree lights, and they just move bits really, really fast. And it, once we get people convinced that that can work, and they also understand that we're also a partner to the fiber world, uh, the acceptance goes up considerably. Unmolested bits, we'll add. Hey, we don't molest our bits. <laughs> <laughs> And Sheldon, for layer one, tell us. Yeah, so, well, I guess, you know, one of the things, obviously, is you, you get to a point of diminishing returns. I think if you got, you know, points and space and, and, and if you, you start with the assumption that they're fixed, you start trying to cut away, you know, a little bit an extra millisecond or now get into microseconds and people talk about nanoseconds, obviously, you, what the challenge is you start to run into physical limitations. You can't beat physics. Uh, so people will sometimes say they, went faster than the speed of light only to find out that that's not true. <laughs> so um, so that, that there's really that. And so people st will start getting creative with doing things like they might disable forward error correction or take out regenerative elements where they normally would have put them. And then that starts to put in trade-offs, you know, with respect to the reliability of the message. And so how far are you really willing to take that? And so I think that's, you know, definitely a challenge uh, or, you know, an issue with it. Uh, the other thing is if you just look at the nature of the switching equipment, that resides at data centers, um, you know, because it's a packet-based kind of thing, you, you, you inevitably deal with um, uh, uh, uncertainty in the latency and uh, that comes about just from uh, queuing delays and contention for ports and so on. So there's that aspect of it uh, for, for one to deal with. Um, and then I think another thing is just uh, what I would say is, uh, you know, as people start to evolve data centers and so on, there's the whole protocol soup to deal with. There's lots of talk about virtualizing data centers and uh, how one would go about doing that. Um, and uh, there's many competing protocols, some are proprietary, a whole stack of them, if you will, for, for solutions there. So I think that that's definitely a challenge for those who are responsible for the infrastructure. Um, so, you know, when it, I think when it comes to uh, how do you solve it, 
you know, at the highest level, obviously, one would look at it from a system perspective. You, everything, everything from the algorithmic aspect of it, uh, distribution of app, you know, the app, distributed nature of applications, uh, you know, all, all this part of it, and how you optimize that protocols and so on. Um, uh, you did, uh, another part of it. So, um, yeah, so getting back to, to the solutions here, uh, you obviously look at it from a systems perspective. Um, I think there's also an opportunity for equipment vendors to provide low latency like we do. So, you know, whether it's at the component of it, like I mentioned earlier, I think doing it from a, uh, looking at the overall point to point and everything that goes in between, do it as a system design problem is, is one way of addressing that. Um, uh, the other thing here uh, with, with switching equipment, it's, I, I think uh, uh, the tendency is to undersubscribe. This is often done to remove the, the inherent jitter you get with switching equipment, but then that has inefficiencies associated with it, so people will move towards, uh, I know I'm going a little long here, but uh, we'll move towards, uh, um, they'll move towards, uh, uh, for that switching equipment, they'll move towards, um, uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, connection-oriented technologies in order to, to address that, uh, get over the packet queuing delays and, um, uh, so but I think the most, I want to get to the most interesting opportunity here, I think might be in the virtualization, if you will, aspect of it. Like we talk about fixed points, but it seems to me there might be an opportunity sort of longer term looking there on if you can virtualize what's happening at those fixed points and find a way to move them closer together somehow in a virtual space, like the whole concept of virtual data centers. Maybe there's an opportunity there longer term and it would be really interesting to see if something like that comes about and especially in the context, I think, of software-defined networking, how one, one might uh, do something like that. I think that could be very interesting. So for those challenges and opportunities, let's go to Satoshi. All right. Um, I don't want to dis distract the conversation in terms of uh, faster, faster speed and low, uh, low latency. But also, uh, from another angle, uh, I'd like to point out the uh, important thing for financial sectors is um, reliability for network services, uh, obviously. And the, essentially, they are looking for 100% SLA. And uh, uh, fiber, fiber uh, telecommunications company, as well as you know, um, wireless companies, uh, friends, um, we uh, need to serve or provide the uh, best uh, quality of services. Um, in, in, in order them, uh, for them to do so, we are going to provide power and cooling we don't want, you know, fiber networks in right. order for them to provide it. This is what we are doing. So. Thank you. And the two service providers are international. Go, Bjarni. <clears throat> well, I think, um, as Satasi was talking about cooling, I think the personal challenge that we are faced <laughs> with is, is, you could bring your equipment in here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It is it's absolutely freezing in here. I'm worried about here. Uh, but I'd like to talk about the challenges and and from the point of view of the, the customers first. And uh, when we were talking about the high frequency traders or the, the financial, financial traders, their challenge is that the, is normally it is the vendor, it's a dream world for um, customers when there's fierce competition among vendors. Uh, but now in this instance, when it, it's a question of the lowest, having the lowest latency uh, circuit, it is a nightmare for them because there's fierce competition and the network operators are constantly improving their, uh, their own network and getting a little bit ahead, shaving two milliseconds or, or 30 mi microseconds away from their network so they're a little bit faster than, than uh, the, the one that is currently faster, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So and you can do that more easily on the, when you're a network operator. You can do that more easily um, terrestrially. You can cut that corner, um, go through that church, drill through that hill, so you share that one millisecond to make your connection between Chicago and New York, say, uh, the fastest. So that's the challenge that, yeah. that our customers are faced with. But there I lay, lies our opportunity as uh, we are operating, we, we are providing that fastest connectivity for our customers. So if we don't, if, if Hibernia doesn't happen to own the, the fastest network, we're certainly going to partner up with, with the ones that, uh, that uh, owns the fastest connectivity down to Bovesta and offering that. And Eric, sorry to say that, if somebody beats you, I will be there and, and, and providing the fastest connectivity to Bovesta over that, over that somebody. So that's rather than being the f uh, high frequency yeah. traders and having to do all that research and continuously stay on, on top of that, um, we do that 
for those for the customers. That's very smart. That's now, in, but in ter terms of challenge for our, for us, the um, the vendors, and I like to touch on what Shelton was saying. Uh, sometimes it is that people claim to be faster than light. <laughs> uh, we are we are building a a, a a transatlantic network, a new transatlantic cable, which is the fastest that you can do because it, it, it is speed of light and distance. Uh, that gives you the latency. It's very very simple. And when I hear that people are beating our our um, our proposed 59.8 millisecond latency, it first of all I. I check whether they're drilling through the core of the earth because that's the only way to, <laughs> uh, to be faster. Um, and I scratch my head, what, what is happening? And that's, that what uh, causes confusion uh, uh, a number of times because we can't expect our customers to do all the due diligence. They just take people at, at their face value. Um, so it takes a few weeks and months to convince, put the ruler on the, on the map and say, no, you, you can't actually do that. You can't, you can't be speed of light. So one of the challenges is reality and helping your reality, customers so, yeah. to recognize reality. Eric? Yeah, I mean, I agree 100%, and that's why at, at Globe, from day one, we've embraced partnerships um, because we believe that, look, it, you cannot do it all. And what people don't realize is that these things cost an awful lot of money. Um, I take my hat off to Bjarni and his team for building Project Express because, you know, they're, they're way up there. In, in terms of, of the amount of money that they need to invest in order to build latency to shave off, let's say, eight milliseconds. So creating the business case to do that um, it, is, is not easy, right? And in our case, unless somebody builds a new subsea network that's probably gonna cost them somewhere between 300 million and, and, and half a billion dollars, you're, there's just no way of doing it faster, right? So, and, I, and, and, and just to elaborate on that, th that's the difference between the terrestrial uh, competition on the submarine. Exactly. You, you can always, as I said, uh, cut through that, that hill or drill through that hill or, or, or cut through that church to add, uh, to shave one millisecond away from the terrestrial rod. You cannot do that submarine. You you're either build a new cable altogether, yep. 300 million dollar project or... Or more. No, that, that, I mean, I think that's exactly it. And then the other thing that you need to ask yourself, going back to what Bjorn mentioned is, um, you, you will see some claims and then you really need to tell the guys, I said, look, this is what I commit. I cannot do anything better. Don't ask me to squeeze, let's say on my route, more because we just can't. I mean, that's, it's, the, it's physics of things, right? Now let me see how you came up with your number. And then you realize that they're playing all sorts of games to come up with supposedly a slight better latency number. I think, I think the traders are learning about this. Um, I think uh, companies like Hibernia ourselves are doing the, a fairly good job in educating them. Um, and then the, the, the real question is, is if, if they need access to, or they need to be a little bit faster and they cannot get it from the network, where are they going to get it from? And that's when you start playing around with algorithms. That's where people start investing money in high performance supercomputers and, and trying to squeeze out speed and the calculation. How fast can I run these numbers so I can see the number on the screen and then hit the button and make that, let's say, and make that trade, right? So it's not only about infrastructure, it's looking at the whole ecosystem and then saying, all right, where as a financial customer, um, where can I squeeze latency to just be a little bit better than somebody else? Um, and, that's, and I think that's what we're seeing. So from a, uh, we're very open, let's say, to partnerships, as we said, with, with Hibernia. I mean, there's people that, are, that need to connect, let's say, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange with Bovespa, and so then you do terrestrial, subsea, and then you jump on terrestrial again, and that's where you can find, let's say, some savings. Let me jump on that network. Maybe it's, it's your yeah. microwave network or somebody else's that's going to take you from our landing point straight, let's say, to that Chicago Mercantile Exchange. But at the end of the day, these networks need to be built. And, and you know, companies like, like Allied Fiber, like Hunters, um, they're, they're going to look at it and they're going to say, how fast can I recover my investment in order to do that? Or, or if Telehouse builds a new data center, these things are not cheap. And so you really need to look at the gamut of, of solutions and then figure out whether you can recover them in time. You know? And how fast is this market gonna grow and how long it's gonna last. You know? but, but until that point, I think we all are gonna be working very closely together and in, in just trying to come up with a solution that our customers are looking for. Thank you. Uh, we'll pick up that financial point later, but <clears throat> going on the reality point, let's talk about the balance between security and latency. If you get the lowest latency, how much security can you get, or is there an inherent trade-off 
in those items that everybody wants perfect. Whoever wants to answer. I'll actually that. start with that because it's always got a bit of a uh, taboo or in the wireless space uh, with uh, security. Um, <clears throat> but you know, to our theme of not molesting our bitstream, uh, the last thing you want to do in a latency transmission application is try to put encryption on it. Um, from the wireless standpoint, at least, the key piece of technology that we focus on is keeping our product all layer one. By all layer one, it's, it's bits in, bits out. We look like a wire to the switch we're handing off to. And it's important that a wireless application stay that way. Uh, if you end up trying to do too much in the wireless application, you almost guarantee yourself you're going to be slower than fiber. And where we get our benefit is in the media transmission, where we're actually close to the speed of light uh, when we go from antenna to antenna. But if every time we drop down to regenerate signal, we're adding hundreds of microseconds, we're not going to have the competitive benefit. Now, mind you, wireless is typically that, uh, that's, it's the edgy network. You, know, you need the fiber to back it up, so you have yeah. both the reliability piece, and you're going to give up some reliability in wireless, but try to put encryption uh, or any sort of encryption in wireless is really like a cat in pajamas. Uh, you know, you don't want to try to do something uh, that's not your strong suit. We focus on one thing and we do it well, and I think that's what's you know, driving our business, uh, but it, it's sort of like trying to be a layer two or layer three radio. Uh, it's the department of redundancy department. You've got a switch talking to a switch that talks to a switch that talks to a radio. That slows things down as well. So I think across the application, and I, I appreciate these guys talking about client education because from the wireless side, well, we, we have a little bit of a black magic stigma, you know, <laughs> taking that black magic piece out through education and responsible uh, communication for what can and cannot be done, uh, we view as very essential. And we've always tried to put ourselves in that thought leading position. But the encryption piece is an absolute no starter for us. Thank you. And I, uh, and I could, uh, when, you, when you ask a question in front of audience um, like this, it's very, the easy answer is we would never jeopardize security or, or safety for latency. But in reality, the, the reality of it is that latency comes first. For, for these guys, uh, the latency comes first. And then reliability and the security catches up. A few years ago, when, when people were trying to shave off, and, and not trying, but shaving off the latency, the 100 millisecond here, 100 millisecond there, they said, OK, well, I, I, will, I will accept that it's not the 99.999999 percent um, uptime and reliability that I, I need to have for my traditional network, but that's fine. If I can trade faster than others, 99.9% .9 of the time, and be out for five hours every once in a while or three hours, so be it. So, so that is the reality. So they, 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 it is accepted that you sacrifice some, and, and people on wouldn't be bu building um, wirelessly between Chicago and New York unless they accepted that. Uh, fiber does not, is not, a, um, uh, impacted by weather, wireless is. Exactly. If there's a big storm, okay, yeah, I, I accept that. So, so that's the reality. There is there is a trade-off. However, having said that, security and reliability catches up. Once once they have the the, the, the connectivity in place, uh, we will figure out a way to make it more and more and more reliable. So there's there's a certain element of trade-off. And that's that's basically what we're seeing as well. I mean, for example, in the in the route to Bovespa. Um, since I said before, it's, unless you change the subsea component, which is the longest piece in the network, the only place that you can save really is at the end, right? And, and we've looked at wireless technologies, and we've had some of our customers come over and say, look, I tell you what, I'll take your route, this terrestrial route, um, but I would like to complement that with a wireless route. Um, as long as I can get a permit to go over the mountain, then to have two or three hops and try to really shave off, I don't know, maybe 50 kilometers, right? So it, it, it ends up really being a bean counter equation, right? You're gonna have somebody in the back room running an Excel spreadsheet saying, okay, it, how much more am I willing to pay to have that reliability? And, and what can I afford in terms of a hit if the network goes down, right? So if you're running, for example, wireless at a very high frequency, it starts to rain like a tropical rain, forget it. I mean, there's just nothing you can do. Um, but if you have, a, uh, let's say, a fiber backup that has, happens to be just a little bit longer, then you say, okay, I'm, I'm willing to live with it. Now, we've also talked to some companies and said, look, do what you can, guarantee me this. If, if we can put in another uh, partner for that last mile, let's say, we'll do it. Because we know that if the network goes down, for whatever reason, whether it's on the subsea or on the wireless or on the threshold, I lost my trade anyway. 
right? So I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, do my business model based on the highest uptime that you can give me, and if they can live with that, that's fine. So that's their business model. We can just help them as much as we can to to improve that reliability. And I agree with Jay 100%. The more pieces of equipment you add to that equation, the slower it's going to get. It's, it's simple. Yeah, maybe what I'll add, I, I absolutely concur with a lot of this. Like when it comes to uh, security, um, you know, you can do security at a lot of different layers, in, again, in the networking, you know, protocol stack, if you will. Uh, we as a company do not do uh, uh, built-in encryption right within our equipment. I, I think the, the general thing there is people like to push out that encryption as close to the edge where the application lives, right, because then everything in between becomes encrypted. Um, now what you can run into, and we see this, for example, with protection switching, kind of an analogy there, where people will start doing it at various layers because no one layer sees the other layer very well, and so you start to sort of lose visibility, and it kind of compounds itself and becomes a bit of a complicated problem. I think security kind of is the same. So many aspects, of course, are orthogonal to latency, but when it comes to encryption and authentication, absolutely, it's related to it. So you can do it at layer zero, you can do it at layer one, you can do max sec, you can do IP sec, but you can do secure socket layer right out to the socket level where the application lives. And I think that's probably the most common thing to be doing. And if you are doing it there, you have to ask yourself the question, would you be doing it at other layers underneath that? And so I agree with what Jay's saying there. Probably doesn't make a lot of sense to have nested levels of encryption because why do you need to do it multiple times? So, so and, and, and in terms of what is the hit, I would say, um, there's no reason because you can offload that encryption to hardware devices. It doesn't have to be that high. It can be on the order of, say, a few microseconds at most. It's possible to do that. So you'll get some small hit. You, you can never have pure, you know, without encryption, then you're not encrypted and it's not secure from that standpoint. There'll always be a hit. But I think it can be minimized by doing it at one point only. And, and you know, sometimes, Judy, it's just not about, let's say, the electronics or the algorithms. It goes to very basic, old school stuff, right? <laughs> You just have to have the right building with the right guards, with the right protection. You just try to protect the physical integrity, let's say, of that, of that network. And if the endpoints are physically secure, right? Yes. Then, then at least you, you've added that additional layer that has nothing to do with our telecom, let's say, offering, but it's right. just the fact that the, that the whole point to point is is, is well run and, and well protected, and then you're, then you're good. Well, that's a good point. I want to build on that, if I may, just because if you look at the wireless side too, a properly designed, and again, I say we take wireless out of wireless, we hand off wires to our clients, not boxes. And in that string of Christmas tree lights, Eric's point spot on because if someone's going to try to get in and steal our signal, we're going to know about it. Our interface between the antennas lets one antenna know if something's going on that's theft. Uh, you can program the radio to shut itself down and maybe someone gets a bit or two or three, but it's not enough to do any real damage. So it really, it, there is an old school piece to it and it, I think a lot of it comes back to some smarts in thinking about the application holistically, not just from a pure box shop in our piece of the business. And one other thing I want to just lead on to is the absolute ne necessity that the wireline and the wireless pieces cooperate. I, I don't think any network that, if, that's in the air by itself is gonna get the kind of availability that people are gonna want, and anything that's in the ground, you need to have that diversity, uh, and there's a lot of bits to share, and, and one begets the other in terms of driving capacity. So just to build yeah, on that. It is very complementary, especially when you think about the separate networks that, that like Clubnet or Hibernia operate. Uh, the the, the uh, separate piece is only part of the exchange to exchange, like if we take mm -hmm. London to New York, and of course, our Hibernia Express goes from the Cape Atlantic station in UK to our Cape Atlantic station on the other end. But then it's, it's a question of how do you get from the Cape Atlantic station to the exchange itself. And there you have uh, the, the complement, uh, how complementary the, the wireless can be to the wire. Yeah, our subterranean wireless is not exactly five yeah. times. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'd, I'd love to see those boys with the... <laughs> Not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> but but, but I, have, I have been asked that question. <laughs> and, and, and let me add one piece to that on the sub C. I I mean, sometimes people don't think about this, right? But our, our biggest threats are, outside of the natural disasters, are fishermen, right? Or anchors or, or boats yeah. that are not packed apart where they're supposed to be. And what, what we did at Globenet at one point, um, first is that we, we, together with our maintenance authority, we, we put a program together just like Hibernia did to educate the fishermen, right? And when the economy goes bad, like for example, up and down the, the New Jersey coast, you're gonna see 
you know, fishermen that are fishing where they're not supposed to be fishing, right? Whether they could hit a, a subsea cable, they could hit a, a, a power line that's coming off of one of the, the, the wind farms, et cetera. And so we came up with a slogan like, like catch fish, not cable. And so what, what we did is, is we went out to, uh, or our maintenance authority uh, on our behalf went out and they met with the fishermen and you do the barbecue and then you tell them, look, here's, here's the GPS coordinates, here's where the cables are, don't, don't fish here. And at, at one point it got, it got kind of close. So we hired a former fisherman to actually patrol our route. So you have a boat, it's not cheap, but you have a boat going up and down the fiber route just to make sure that they don't fish there until uh, let's say that the authorities catch up with the fact that, hey, by the way, there's people that are doing something that they shouldn't, right? And you can use the same analogy, let's say, for terrestrial networks. And that's when you really look at, at the physical integrity of your network and you say, when I design a network and when I build a network, um, you take into consideration the fact that, like in South America, people go into manholes to steal fiber, well, to steal cable, and thinking that it's copper so that they can sell it. And the reality is they cut the fiber and, oops, I can't sell glass. So... <laughs> you got it right on the outside. So I wonder if under the sea you've got these little spaces where there are all the fish laying their eggs and clustering and having parties right over the cable. Come on over here, guys. It's real safe. So what are the other international challenges, particular international challenges, for you guys going to the uh, international cities? Well, I, um, you mean like licenses? That, that, that would be the main challenge is the licenses are different different operating uh, uh, requirements, but that, that's what a company like Hibernia is, is shines in doing. We are operating in, um, I think, 15 countries now, and we have to be licensed in all of these countries, uh, which frees our customers from having to do that. But it, 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 you need to, in order to go into Paris, you have to have a, a, a French company, you have to have a, a French telecom license, despite all the European Union. Um, they haven't unified telecom. Okay. Um, <laughs> I was going to say debacle, but I'm not going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you want to go in Germany and Frankfurt, you have to be licensed there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that, those are the things that our, our, our customers are, are faced with. But in order to provide any services into those regions, we have to be that, have to do that anyway. So that's what we, that's what we have uh, sold. We, we did that originally, not realizing how, how challenging and valuable it would be. It's just out of necessity. But that it, it certainly we found out that it, can't, it, it can take years mm -hmm. to get into some of these countries. Yeah. And once you have that, then you have something to offer to others. And, 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 and complementing that, I think the whole regulatory framework is very, is very challenging, right? So for example, in Brazil, uh, we've had several of our partners say, hey, you know, I'll, I'll give you the router, just drop it into your landing station or to your city pop. Um, and we just can't do that. Um, it, the equipment needs to be homologated, number one. And number two, if I don't take ownership of the equipment, let's assume that, you know, any one of, of you um, puts a piece of equipment that has not been authorized by the regulator, then not only myself as the president of the company, but the CEO of the entire group can go to jail because it's a criminal act according to the regulation. Um, so you really need to be careful. You really need to know the rules of engagement um, before you go into new territory. And I think you know uh, what Hibernia has done, what we have done ourselves and other people are doing is just don't assume that the fact that you can do it in the US easily or in some European country easily is gonna be the same around the world. It is not. It is very, very different. Um, I was just telling somebody I was meeting earlier that, that yes, Latin America, except for the Guyanas and, and perhaps Brazil, they're all Spanish speaking, but you cannot go at, at, at the country assuming that everybody eats tacos and burritos. <laughs> you know, they speak a different language, right? I mean, it may be Spanish, but the words are different, regulation is different, customs are different. And so you need to tropicalize your offering to everywhere that you, everywhere that you go. And if you don't pay attention to, to regulation, you're, you're going to be in trouble. So, so it's important to do that up front and do it very, very, very well. So you've got regulatory, you've got cultural, you've got fishermen probably off every coast that you have to work with. And, uh, well, the, the, the proactive maintenance, and, and, and Eric said it, the proactive maintenance when it comes to the fishermen and, and how to product, how proactively protect your cable is barbecue, beer, and whiskey. <laughs> so you mean no North Atlantic uh, filet of fiber? <laughs> <laughs> but that's what, that's what you have to do. You have to be there. You have to be there every quarter just to see, guys, remember that this is the map of my cable. It has 9,000 volts on it. Don't, it will kill yourself if you... Uh, it's going to jeopardize your boat and your your crew if you entangle yourself. So you have to you have to get them get them rally them around the the, the concept of don't uh, 
dry gear, fishing, fishing gear. So do you work together on these barbecue, beer, and uh, parties? <laughs> well, it, it, there's, a, there's actually a formal consortium that, that does that, uh, yes. The barbecue yeah. party consortium? Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you don't want to call it that, but yes. Yeah, so Where's the sign-up sheet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Signing sheet. That's good. Yeah, so, we, oh. good. Go ahead, please. We always, oh, yeah, as a Caucasian provider, too, international challenge is always, you know, as yeah. you, oh, everybody pointed out, the regulation thing. That's why uh, in order to like, penetrate in the, in the market, we always partnership with, uh, with the local providers like Hong Kong, like Hankou, that we did. This is a very important thing, partnership. That's good, thank you. Let's talk about the different technologies that offer different kinds of latency. And one that we've had a lot of conversations with is coherent technology. And do we want someone to define coherent technology for the audience? Sheldon, you want to give us the, 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 the short the version so that we all can uh, yeah, yeah, live it day to day. Um, so, yeah, with, so the thing about coherent um, is if you look how traditional fiber optic networks worked, um, the, the way that transceiver technology normally worked is it would just modulate the intensity of light, off, you know, turn it on and off. And it turns out that if that's all you do with the light, without getting into the deep physics about it here, it's if you have a, a, f a phenomenon that operates on the optical field over, over the fiber, um, and in this case dispersion is, the main, is one of the main issues there, um, then it's very difficult to compensate for that in the electrical domain. In other words, people would normally do it right on the optical field using dispersion compensation modules. They could be based on fiber braggrating technology, dispersion compensating fiber are the two primary ones. Um, now what coherent does is, is really, there's a couple things that, that it does for you. And, and, and coherent just means using a local, first of all, you're using a laser at the receiver that you're coherently mixing with the received signal. And by doing that, it allows you to recover both uh, essentially amplitude and phase information in that optical field. That's, that's really what it does for you. So what does that translate to? Uh, one is certainly better receiver sensitivity, but the big one is you can do all kinds of fancy things now in the electrical domain in terms of how you process that signal. This is where the so-called digital signal processing DSP comes in. So you can completely compensate for dispersion. And what's interesting about it is you can do it uh, for dispersion, uh, not just you know, 1,000 or 2,000 picoseconds per nanometer, but 40,000, 50,000 uh, picoseconds per nanometer. You can also do it for uh, polarization mode dispersion. So that's really one of its core features is all of a sudden you can compensate for these optical impairments entirely with electronics. And we know electronics really well, and there's lots of high scale integration and, and algorithms, all kinds of neat things you can do in the electrical domain that just isn't possible in the optical domain. So that's really the main, uh, the main benefit behind it. Let, let me add my, my non-technical five cents to, to that piece. And that, that, I mean, if you look, for example, at subsea networks, um, and Bjarne is doing it at Hibernian, we're doing it at GlobeNet. I mean, you have a glass in the water, and you've got, you know, repeaters amplifying signals. And at the end of the day, it's not like you can do a truck roll like you do in a terrestrial network. Um, you build a network for 25 years, and hopefully you'll never have to lift it, right? And it, if you look at a terrestrial network, many people build fiber infrastructures with, you know, with 296 count or more fiber pairs. In, in subsea, we have four, right? And so, and you're managing terabits of data through those four fiber pairs. And so what you want to do is you want to try to squeeze the most amount of, imagine that, that a fiber pair is like a freeway, and then you have X number of freeway lanes, how many big trucks can I put on that freeway? That's what you're really doing. And um, and that's where coherent technology comes in. We're, are, we're deploying a network um, with advanced coherent technology. And so what that allows us to do is to have 100 gig waves, 100 by 100, 150 by 100, over a fiber pair. So what does that really mean to, to companies like ourselves is basically you can just squeeze more wavelengths inside of your infrastructure. So where before maybe I had a 10 gig wave, tomorrow I can put a 100 gig wave. Or if you look at the cable system that we have between Bermuda and the United States, it was designed for five gigs uh, in 1997. And we've been able to squeeze out a terabit out of that cable system over the last, let's say, 12, 12 or so years, right? So indirectly what this means is that you're adding life to your infrastructure but being able to put more wavelengths into, let's say, into the system. The added benefit, of course, of using some of these technologies is that if they're well done, it improves latency. 
But the real benefit, let's say, to us in the subsea world is not as much the latency as the fact that I can get a lot more out of my network. And that's, so that's where, where Wait, we see So, so the, the networks are, are, are similarly global and, and Hibernia. They are they're designed for 10G technology, and what the coherent allows is it allows for an introduction of 40G and, and 100G waves on the same plant without having to re, uh, replace uh, the repeaters that are lying on the, on the ocean bed, which you never would do. We have 280 repeaters every 50 kilometers. Um, so you, you, you don't touch those, or not, not what you don't. Hope you never have to touch those. So that, that's what it allows for. It, it, it allows for loads and loads and loads of, of more capacity on the same submarine infrastructure. If we didn't, if we hadn't, or our, if the vendors, uh, the equipment vendors hadn't come up with the technology, we would probably have to, um, we've had, had to build new submarine cables some time ago with, at the cost of two or three hundred million dollars per. So the, the, all the global infrastructure, especially for the internet, and all the benefits that we enjoy, the cheap benefits that we, that we enjoy by video over internet and, and all that would be way more expensive now. So that's what it does. But however, what, what it does, talk, talking about the latency, uh, as I understand it, um, being non-technical, so Sheldon, you, you keep me on track here. Um, the, what, the, uh, what it does is it actually encompasses and, and, and has the DCM, so the disc, uh, compensation dispersion compensation module or the fact the, the forward direct correction. Jim, that was good, right? <laughs> um, it has it built in. So all that actually does or can introduce um, latency. So it's a, it's a trade off there. So you might not always want to, when you're, when you're servicing the, uh, the financial customers, you might not always want to uh, deploy this technology. You might want to deploy 10G technology when you're, when you're actually servicing the, the absolutely lowest latency. Mm -hmm. um, customers. Oops, I, I spelled out a trade secret. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can just add to what Bjarni uh, was saying there. Um, uh, so just so, so for everyone to know, the, um, the, the standard way people have done dispersion compensation for many years was using dispersion compensating fiber. And, and as a general rule of thumb, you need about, for every 100 kilometers of transmission fiber, about 20 kilometers of DCF. And so what that translates to is for any link, however long it is, with that, you increase your latency by about 20%. That's a lot. So coherent technology allows you to remove that completely. So that's, that's the benefit because it's doing it all in the electrical domain ah, with essentially no latency or very, very minimal in the DSP portion. Now, having said that, one thing that's important to understand, because you mentioned 10 gig wavelengths, um, it is possible to have your cake and eat it too. In other words, you can deploy systems that are compatible with 100 gig coherent technology gives you all the spectral efficiency and all the wonderful things, but that are also compatible with 10 gig wavelengths. And to be compatible with 10 gig wavelengths, you still need that bulk compensation if you want to use commoditized 10 gig transceivers. So how do you do that? Well, what you can do is don't use DCF. You use next generation so-called bulk compensation technologies. And these would be, for example, based on fiber brag ratings because fiber brag ratings are about that big. So that's the latency through that much space. So it's nothing. So you can deploy those and have uh, coherent if you want, have 10 gig if you want, any type of 40 gig if you want, the best of both worlds. Thank you. We have just a few more minutes. If there are any, I haven't seen any hands yet, but I haven't given you much chance. Any hands? I have one more question then. Okay. The next 12 to 24 months, as I say, we count that there are right now about 20 to 30 players who are willing to pay up for high speed. Maybe will there be many more who get into this game? Will the regulators come in and change the game and take them all out and you'll have to go to your contingency plans? Or what do you think is going to happen over the next year or two? Uh, I'll start, start this one up again, Judy. Uh, from, our, from our seat, the, the trading space, we refer to it internally as our military industrial complex. We get to invent some really cool technology that these folks can pay for. They, they have the will to invest in it. But as we're a layer one shop in transmission and we focus on systems, you can make the connection quite quickly that layer one backhaul, for example, to take care of video streams at very high capacities is another useful tool. Uh, I think I'll quote Mr. Newby at one point uh, saying that you know, fiber to every tower is a dream, or the dream, but it's also a dream. You know, it's just not gonna happen. So that's another participatory way that the wireless application and the fiber application have to work together, but in terms of Regulatory pieces coming in, I think that uh, there's some of that happening right now a little bit. We're seeing a tremendous boom in our European 
uh, of business as a result. But that's going to change ebb and, ebb and tide. And I would also argue that even in the trading game, these guys want to have the fastest car. So I think that we all need to continue to work to, to drive towards that. And there'll be ancillary benefits, I think, for all of us uh, here in these guys on the service side that have various verticals in their business. We've got the same in ours. Thank you very much. It's obvious that you know uh, many financial sectors is going to um, you know demand more, and, uh, higher and higher speed, definitely for sure for uh, 12 months uh, or 12, uh, 24 months to go, and uh, and that's why the um, the tele telecommunications company are uh, providing a very stable, very high speed, very good quality service. That's why. Um, under that, uh, we are going to provide as a co-location provider to continue to towards the uh, such demand. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. So yeah, I mean, it's certainly on the high speeds, that, that's that's a, 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 I think a given that it's going to happen. So we go, you know, people talk about one gig, sort of the, as a service, ten gig, and then it'll be forty and hundred. So there's no question that that's it'll all be trans. That'll be one of the things. Um, you know, the other thing that I think can come into it. Um, I'll just mention it because I think with the efforts of, of things like the Metro Ethernet form and how they're standardizing uh, user network interfaces, you'll see more pull towards having very standardized Ethernet interfaces that maybe can support things like virtual flows, like Ethernet virtual private line, more emphasis on that. But, but the big one, I think, I'll, I'll, what I said at the, the beginning there, just, I mean, it seems to me that with the, the way things are transitioning to uh, virtualizing the data centers, unifying switching fabrics, and um, the whole software-defined networking and the push for that, that maybe there's an opportunity here somehow to get those two points in space that we're fighting to get lower latency with, and somehow in that virtual world, let them move together. Thank so, you. Interesting. Yeah. Look, I'm very excited with what I hear. We happen to be in, in probably one of the fastest growing regions in the world. And, and you have that typically when you're in an area of, of uh, developing countries. And as long as things are going in the right direction, we will continue to, to serve, uh, let's say, those communities. So definitely 12 to 24 months is short term. And in that short term, we will continue to see these things. Um, I believe that it's going to be significantly longer before the, it, it may taper off in terms of the number of players, but each player is going to want to have more bandwidth. And they're going to want to have more services, and that's basically what you need to be ready um, to provide, let's say, to those users. And that goes back to solidifying the partnerships with with companies that that offer complementary service or or solution for those, let's say, for those players. And one thing that you cannot forget is that, for example, in the subsea world, it takes you a good three years to build a new system, if not more, right? Probably five years from the moment you start doing the the, the financials and the validation and get the funding and and then put it in the water and deliver it. And, and the, you would not be doing a huge investment in the multi-million dollar, you know, 300 to 500 million dollars if you didn't know that in your projections you're going to get uh, some money to recover that investment over time. So It's nice that we offer an addictive service. Nobody ever wants less <laughs> of what we offer. Bjarni, you know well how long it takes to build these networks. Um, yeah, absolutely do. Uh, but if the, uh, to the question, so your question was, um, do we see a lot of spill out or, or, or newcomers come in? There, there's, there are about 20 to 30 main uh, high frequency traders or very, very savvy um, traders that, that uh, can justify paying a substantial premium for our services. There, are, there will always be new players coming in and we have seen new players come in and there's some fall out. They, what what uh, they thrive on is all their PhD degrees and all the algorithms and the, the geniuses that, that, that work there and, and use our, our connectivity. And that's a, a fierce com competitive environment. But what they don't control and what will be very interesting to see is the, the regulatory environment. Tobin tax or no Tobin tax, what happens uh, as a result of recent elections in Europe and in US how is the um, the election going to come here? Uh, go here? Uh, is it going to stay? Uh, are the, is the current government going to stay in, in or are, is somebody else going to take over? That's probably going to impact whether there will be a tax here or not. We have seen in Europe that uh, European Union has actually agreed to put a try to put an, a, a a tax in place, but on, only under a certain uh, restrictions or conditions. If a minimum of ten countries do it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But um, those countries that have the most to gain or most to lose, 
be Ireland and be UK, mostly UK and Switzerland, they have said absolutely no way over my dead body. There's no, it's not going to be a Tobin tax introduced in London. Um, that is, the, the PM has said that uh, very, very, very clearly. Over 100,000 people, would uh, it would impact the lives of 100,000 people that work in the financial industry in London, and they've just said no. Um, but we as operators, we can have our opinion on that, but we, when we go out to our customers and, and have, the, have that conversation, it's more, much more meaningful what they say. And they do not believe that that's going to significantly impact their business in, in, in that, that they wouldn't or they couldn't justify anymore paying the premium over the lowest latency circuit. They say it, it might change how we use it, but it's always going to be very, very valuable to have those, those circuits. So it's going to be interesting. But another point uh, that plays also into who are the players, it is the development of the assets classes that are being traded under the HFT. Uh, it's traditionally been um, equity trading and derivatives, but now uh, those guys are moving into fixed income uh, and foreign exchange uh, very rapidly, and, and that's actually benefiting us because uh, the, by, by far the towers of the, the FX and the fixed income trading is in New York and, and London, so that's, mm -hmm. uh, that, that calls for even more need for Project Express for us. Fantastic. Thank you all. Thank you. For, and join me in thanking this illustrious group. <laughs>